We move on to our second speaker for today, Professor Roger Sylvester Bradley. If he's not a well-kent face, he's at least a well-kent name. Um, Roger is actually a graduate of Aberdeen University. Um, he graduated in the swinging 60s in, uh, with a BSc honours in agricultural plant science in, in Aberdeen. We all know him as the founder and the, the lead in Yen, the Yield Enhancement Network, hugely important. And if Andy's looking for any technical partner, after Scottish Agronomy, of course, then I think Roger would be his man. We, we all know about Yen. Roger describes himself, and I get this right because he told me this last night, as an action research practitioner. Did I get that right? And he says his aim now, he's been 40 years with ADAS, and his aim now is to try and pass on the vast knowledge he has to the benefit of the rest of the industry, which is a very laudable aim. So, over to you, Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, 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 and the danger is I'll, I've forgotten it all. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I just... Um, Thank you very much for the introduction, and, and, and uh, it, it is a bit like coming full circle, but, you know, 50 years ago is a long time. Um, this is a, I, I don't know, who, I hope it's none of your farms, but anyway, that, that this is an Aberdeenshire farm. I just wanted to have the farm focus for the start of my, my talk. Um, I, I've really struggled to put this talk together. Um, <clears throat> summarizing 50 years of, because I did my first nitrogen experiment 50 years ago. I harvested it in uh, 1973. So, um, I, and there have been a fair few projects since that. So, I've only been able to dip into the ones and dip into the ones that I could remember. And I actually remembered one last night that I've got in my talk. Um, but um, uh, what I'm going to do is to address a series of, I hope, if I've got the time, six questions. They're a bit random and uh, they generally relate to the topic of the day, although I have to say I, I was a bit taken by surprise by the topic of the conference um, when I learned it yesterday and I'm going to interpret it as net zero emissions of whatever. Okay, so, and, and mainly nitrogen because Nitrogen is, is the, the, what I was asked to talk about. So, uh, without too much further ado, I think I'll just go to my first question, uh, which is, uh, and it, it was chosen to sort of try and link with uh, Andy's talk, um, is nitrogen good or bad for the carbon footprint of grain? And uh, the graph I'm wanting to uh, try and share with you is a sort of generic graph that we developed when we've been studying the footprint. I've worked a lot on biofuel production and on nitrous oxide emissions and all that work we've had this graph at the back of our minds and it's a, the traditional, you know, I could draw this graph from my first experiment, and there have been hundreds of experiments since. So we know what nitrogen does to yield. It basically doubles it. So we're going, reading on the right-hand axis here, we're going from four tons to eight tons, okay? But then when we look at the emissions associated with our various inputs, we see that, and they're expressed here per ton of grain. So they do, even though they don't change uh, according to the amount of nitrogen we apply, they do, the emissions do change because the yield goes up, so the yield dilutes the emission associated with cultivations or P and K or seeds or pesticides. But generally, the emissions associated, and this isn't news to you, I'm sure, uh, the these emissions at the bottom are small in relation to the emissions associated with uh, nitrogen. And those emissions are uh, divided between the ones associated with manufacture and the ones associated with infield use after we've applied the granules or liquid or whatever it is. And generally they're due to 
nitrous oxide, which is this very potent climate change, uh, uh, global warming uh, gas, 300 times that of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, we've, we've had mentioned, whilst uh, you were questioning, Andy, about the, uh, you know, the, the prospect of fertilizer manufacturers actually getting this right down. Um, I'm not sure whether Andy's um, zero fertilizer would actually reduce that, but we're gonna, I'm going to look at that, uh, the, the emissions in field, um, but I'm going to look at that a bit later. But the, the important thing, the bit of this graph to me, and it's the bit that doesn't seem to be in the carbon accounting processes that people are using at the moment, is the green bit. So the indirect land use change. And you can make some very, very crude assumptions about what the impact is of not producing grain on your land because it will cause somebody else to change the land use in order to produce that food or whatever it is somewhere else. And that brings the, the a minimum of the emissions total much closer to the maximum of the yield total. And so that really, there's, there's, now that fertilizer is more expensive, there's actually very little difference between the two. So uh, I think it very much depends on how you're doing your calculations, what you conclude is, uh, whether you conclude that nitrogen is good or bad. So that's my, that, that's my first uh, question. And um, the rest of my questions are largely to do with managing an expensive input and coping with the, um, the emissions that are actually non, uh, not associated with carbon. So uh, ammonia emissions, nitrate emissions. Um, oh, I, w I should have said that the um, nitrous oxide emissions, of course, are hugely variable. Um, I guess the conditions in Scotland, but, uh, and we have done a lot of work in Scotland as well as in England, um, the emissions in Scotland tend to be larger than the emissions in England. We were successful in getting the standard assumption about what the nitrous oxide emission is from using fertilizer uh, down from um, the 1% that's been assumed globally to a much more sort of local and generally smaller if the rainfall is similar to what you get in arable conditions, then the emissions are generally smaller than 1%. Um, clay content's obviously important, and you can, you can manage the emissions by choosing particular fertilizers and inhibitors, and I'm going to deal with that in a, a little later. But uh, that was my way of linking with what, what I expected Andy to talk about. Um, but now I want to start to move to uh, uh, the big scale that I was intending to start with, which is the farm scale, which is why I showed a picture of a farm at the start, um, and ask, how can nitrogen losses from arable farms be reduced? Um, and the losses I'm talking about here, um, it's a sort of a, a broad term. Um, and I'm, the, the project I'm going to dip into here is a multi-collaborative project that involved the University of Aberdeen, nicely, um, but also the University of Cambridge and lots of other universities, including nine in China. So it's, it's a broad project we called N-Circle. So the, the idea was to look at nitrogen recycling. And for this, we developed a model farm. Well, um, primarily I developed a model farm. And uh, it started with an arable farm, but the arable farm was designed so that it would feed um, fattening pigs. And I, I didn't mention, it wasn't mentioned in my introduction, but um, I was a, when I was at Aberdeen University, I did a sandwich, uh, a, a practical sandwich, and I was a pigman in that time. So my choice of pigs here was partly influenced by my education in Aberdeen. So um, this, this has become a, a sort of, uh, well, a 
a, a continuing uh, project for me that the project that, the, that was called End Circle has finished, but I am continuing to try and develop this because I think it addresses some of the, um, the, the sort of misconceptions we have when we think as agronomists and as arable farmers about efficiency. I think there's a big uh, omission in our, in our thinking. But generally what, what I'm trying to do with this farm is to get it to be as efficient and uh, without as, uh, the, the, the losses that normally occur. So uh, uh, I'm measuring the inputs to the farm and of course the inputs are fertilizer but also because I've got a, uh, a pig unit that there they feed and the outputs are the, the pigs and the grain. I'm trying to keep it simple but of course we've got nitrate going down the river and we've got ammonia. And ammonia um, on an arable farm is generally, uh, 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 it's not a loss, it's a gain. Um, in Scotland, it's a smaller gain than it is in England, but it does depend very much on your locality. And if you, I, I once um, had an experiment in at, actually at Harper Adams, and we couldn't understand what was going on in this experiment because we seemed to be getting high yields without any fertilizer. And I hadn't visited the site, um, so we went especially to visit the site, the whole group of uh, project that was, we were doing there, and, and we looked upwind, and there was their poultry unit. And, and basically we were getting 100 kilograms of nitrogen free and for nothing from the poultry unit as ammonia. So it, ammonia is, um, is a very important part of the whole operation, and the... UK government is very concerned at the moment about mitigating ammonia emissions and that's why it's looking hard at urea and urea inhibitors. Um, but let's just look a bit harder at that, at the sort of the system or the cycle on that farm. And I, I'm, 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 um, I'm not apologizing for including the pigs in this because I think the pigs, uh, uh, you know, are likely to be eating the grain even if we're selling the grain. So uh, we need to be considering what we're, what we're doing with our grain. Um, so if you consider this cycle uh, in its uh, form there as, um, as maybe the farm was 100 years ago before nitrogen fertilizers were used, so it had pretty poor productivity, it probably wouldn't have supported very many pigs. I haven't done the sums actually to, know, to tell you how many it would have most of the nitrogen would have come as organic manures or other organic materials uh, back into the uh, soil and crop part of the cycle. Um, but then we started using fertilizer and we geared the whole thing up. We started being a lot more productive, so the yields went from basically two tons to eight tons uh, uh, per hectare of, of cereals. Um, we'd be able to feed you know, four times as many pigs, and, um, but, and the emissions started increasing. Um, so the challenge for me in this, in this modeling has been to amass the ideas, and I've done this with the group of, uh, that's in the project from all the universities and so on, and to uh, assemble a lot of evidence that, to see if we can wind this whole thing down and stop the emissions. So the, amb the ambition is to use all these sort of thought clouds, um, and I'll just pick out some of them to show the sorts of things we're including. I'll start with the pigs. I've come to the conclusion we feed, we, uh, we don't need to be feeding pigs nearly so much protein. Um, they can actually survive on cereal protein. They don't need pulse protein, and, uh, but Obviously, they wouldn't get the amino acids they need because the seed protein uh, is from a cereal crop is not well balanced in relation to the essential amino acids the pig needs. But now we can buy crystalline amino acids that allow us to basically feed pigs without all that uh, soya or whatever it is, uh, protein. Um, if we can, and that will dramatically reduce the amount of nitrogen being excreted by the pigs and the volume of the excreta. Then we, if we move 
around the circle we get to the crop, if we know that the customer, if you like, for the, for the crop is not needing all that protein, we can look hard at reducing the amount of protein uh, that we, we generate in the cereal grain. If we reduce the uh, protein in the cereal grain, that will reduce its requirement for uh, fertilizer nitrogen and nitrogen uptake. Um, the, the fertilizer that we use, we can modify with inhibitors and choosing the timings and forms very much better. So we'll need uh, much less of that, particularly because we're recycling much more of the nitrogen as manure. And really the big, the big opportunity is in the way we manage uh, livestock manures. Um, what the, the emissions at the moment are probably, you know, they're 80% they're of uh, what, no, I'm saying this the wrong way around. So they're sort of four or five times what they could be if we use all the technologies that are available to actually manage manures better. So the conclusions at the moment, it's still an ongoing um, study that um, I, I don't know when it's going to see the light of day, but it is that we could achieve uh, re N recycled diets without huge human dietary change if we integrated our farming enterprises. And, and that really is what I'm sort of wanting to emphasize that this actually the main emission from arable farming is in the seed whether it's legume seed or cereal seed, that's the main emission. And if we, if we just do our nitrogen use efficiency sum as how much nitrogen am I exporting compared with how much I'm uh, importing as fertilizer, we're misleading ourselves about the impact of our farming operation. Um, so uh, integration is absolutely crucial. We, within the system, we need to look at all ways of minimizing nitrogen demands both of the livestock and of the crop. Um, and there's plenty of progress to be made with both. Um, and that implies growing low protein crops, which I know you're good at in Scotland. Um, and, and possibly, uh, and this is fairly, um, you know, I'm a bit of a heretic here, but, but basically uh, pulses to me, my way of thinking are not necessarily all good news. Um, and then, obviously, maximum, the things that we've been generally uh, getting to understand through the, actually the Regen Ag sort of agenda, but, uh, you know, the importance of rotations, the importance of cover crops, the importance of using manures and biosolids, but also the, the real importance of good manure management. And I particularly pick up on the ability to separate the liquids from the solids and so that the, the liquids we can treat as a nitrogen fertilizer and the solids we can treat as a phosphorus fertilizer. Um, and in, in, in the, as if, if, we, if we move forward with this sort of agenda, then, uh, and this is going to be a recurring theme for uh, the other questions that I'm going to address in the talk, um, we need to be taking really good records so that we're confident about um, what in the end, I think, and certainly the latest sums I've done, is that I think we should be able to get away with very little uh, fertilizer if we can actually recycle uh, from the livestock that use the grain that we grow. So now I'm gonna home in a bit more on, on just the fertilizer decision-making about fertilizer and, and particularly the efficiency of fertilizers. And, and I'm asked the question, can the main losses be stopped? Uh, and I'm not including grain as an emission as it were, as a loss in this, uh, in this section. So um, this is my standard way of explaining uh, fertilizer recommendations. Um, my first involvement in fertilizer recommendations was when soon after I joined ADAS. I was actually responsible for introducing the idea that yield uh, affected the amount of fertilizer that we should use. Um, that's, uh, the understanding of that has become a lot more sophisticated since 1984, which is when that happened. Um, we now understand, 
that nitrogen's role in determining uh, crop growth and therefore the, the optimum amount of nitrogen is uh, primarily to form the photosynthetic canopy. Um, and through the 90s, that's the way we, gener we, we developed this whole idea of canopy management. And, and it was a sort of eureka moment when we could work out that actually whatever the green area of a, a crop was, it contained 30 kilograms per hectare of green area. So there was a direct relationship between the quantity of nitrogen it was taking up and its green area. And that was quite a revelation. But then, um, as the yen has uh, introduced me to much higher yielding crops than we were growing in the 1990s, I've come to recognize that uh, the yield and the potential yield or the, 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 the yield you're likely to grow becomes much more important as the yields go up above, say, 10 tons per hectare. So it's the canopy that's dictating it below 10 tons per hectare, but it's the, the requirement for extra heads that's actually uh, dictating the crop demand uh, above 10 kilograms per hectare. Then we need to... Um, we th need to think about the soil supply. I'm not going to discuss the, the whole subjects of its own, how you estimate soil supply. It's a horrendously difficult thing to do. We can take some measurements, but even that uh, doesn't help us a huge amount. So um, the sum for how much fertilizer or how much nitrogen, I should say, rather than just fertilizer, but how much nitrogen we'll need to apply is obviously the crop demand minus the soil supply. And the fertilizer or the manure has a certain efficiency. And uh, the, it's the inefficiencies that I want to sort of move towards understanding. Uh, one of the most, uh, and I'm sure you all know, that urea is actually less efficient than ammonium nitrate. And the main reason for that is that when it's hydrolyzed, it exists as two uh, ammonium moieties, if you like, connected by a, a, carbon, uh, a carbon atom. And when that becomes hydrolyzed in, uh, into ammonia and carbon dioxide, um, the ammonia uh, is released into the atmosphere. Or well, not all of it, but 10% of it, of, or of that order, is uh, emitted into the atmosphere, and that causes uh, poor air quality. But that's not the main inefficiency. The main inefficiency is to do with the unrecovered nitrogen, the nitrogen that stays in the soil. Um, but, uh, and I'm going to deal with that a bit more later. But uh, So the sum that we do is the crop demand minus the soil supply divided by the fertilizer recovery. And it's really the recovery that, of, of by a crop of the material that we apply that I want to focus on. Um, it, it's not explicit in fertilizer recommendations, really, what, what, these, what these inefficiencies are. It, it, there is sort of mention, I mean, I know RB29 better than I know your uh, SAC technical uh, notes, but um, it, it is mentioned that urea is less efficient, but it doesn't say do anything about it. Um, the, it, it's not mentioned at all that sandy soils actually allow better recovery of uh, ammonium nitrate than uh, chalky soils, and, and clay soils are somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, the recoveries are about 60% on average, so there's quite a lot of the fertilizer that we apply that doesn't get into uh, the crops. So. Uh, not not immediately into the crops, and and so um, obviously this is uh, I'm I'm just going to go through the different uh, main fertilizer types now. So we've got granules and prills of ammonium nitrate or sulfate, and um, they're immediately soluble. They act straight away. Uh, I, I one of the slides I've taken out of my deck because I was worried about time is. Um, was showing the sort of dynamics of nitrogen uh, release into the soil. It, it, it becomes 
you know, available within a day, but its actual activity lasts, well, uh, at least two months, if not more. So uh, it, it's, it's a fairly, it's, it, you know, it can, you can hit a crop with a small, and you get a small amount of extra nitrogen in within a few days, but it is something that does need uh, strategic planning. Um, we've talked about the nitrous oxide uh, emissions. They're about 1% or a bit less than 1%, depends where you are and what the rainfall is and all this sort of thing. But um, if we inhibit this, we're not going to notice agronomically. Um, so it, it's the inhibition of um, nitrous oxide emissions is, is not something that's going to pay for itself through extra grain production or saving in fertilizer use. Um, th but the other thing I want to say, which probably you don't, uh, you, you sort of isn't primarily in your mind, isn't sort of topmost in your mind, is that actually because we apply fertilizers in the spring just before the soils, just before the crop's about to grow, just before the crop's about to start its fast evapotranspiration, um, and the soil's going to get drier rather than wetter, the chances of the fertilizer which stays in that topsoil um, most of the time it, it, of leaching beyond root range is very small. So immediate leaching, to my mind, is not a big concern as one of our losses. Um, urea, again, is immediately soluble. It, it may take a little bit longer because it does have to hydrolyze before it uh, gets taken up you get this 10% loss, which can be prevented by inhibitors, and you would notice that, and we do notice that in experiments, um, if we inhibit uh, uh, urease, which causes the hydrolysis uh, of urea to ammonium. Um, so, uh, yeah, useful, useful improvements if we're using urea. Um, um, liquids, which are generally a mixture of urea and ammonium nitrate in order to get enough of a concentration, um, that because it's got urea in, again, you get, you get somewhat less, but it's only got half amount of nitrogen as urea, you get a smaller loss, which is also preventable by, uh, by inhibitors. Um, there has been some evidence, both in the yen and in... Uh, independent uh, evidence from France that, and I don't understand why this is, although I have some ideas, that uh, liquid, uh, straight liquid uh, UAN results in lower yields. Uh, uh, we can maybe discuss that later. Th there's a lot more detail that I can't deal with in this time uh, uh, about enhanced efficiency fertilizers and the involvement of all these inhibitors. Um, I'm going to show you a slide about that in a minute, but uh, and then I'm going to show you a slide about the main loss process, the reason that we don't get 40% of the fertilizer into the, into the grain. So um, the, the, we've done a review recently uh, for DEFRA about enhanced efficiency products. These are the main ones, so nitrification inhibitors, urease, and you'll see some, I hope, uh, uh, trade names that you... Uh, recognize here urease inhibitors, mixtures of the two, and then there's some slow release products, and there's also the review covers various uh, biostimulants and microbial um, microbial products and so forth, which I, I, I'm afraid I don't have time to deal with. The main thing I want to do is to show you um, what happens after, in this case, this was one particular experiment, but it's been repeated, and this is just the, the best example. Um, what happens when you apply 100 kilograms of N as ammonium nitrate uh, to a crop of wheat um, in the spring? And um, so we applied 100 kilograms. If you apply 100 kilograms and it was all either available or already taken up, you would expect the, uh, the, the sum of the crop N and the soil mineral N to be uh, along this dotted line here. If you get more than that uh, after you apply your fertilizer, it signifies you've caused some of the soil nitrogen to become released. If you get less than that, it implies that some of your fertilizer has gone into the soil microbiome that everybody 
uh, is so interested in but, uh, and seems to regard as a good thing, but I think this is uh, evidence to the opposite. Um, this is what we see happening from these three separate applications on three uh, separate plots. So uh, generally, the nitrogen becomes immediately available and uh, it was a bit drier for this third application, so it took a bit longer to become immediately available. Uh, be, be, to become available, but um, uh, and uh, the, the, there is the, 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 these uh, these momentary mineralization events are more common than um, than I can ignore, and we're wondering whether there isn't a salt effect so that you can actually cause your fertilizer can cause some uh, breakdown of the microbiome and and it releases uh, nitrogen available nitrogen, but. In the end, about 30-40% of the fertilizer becomes uh, uh, immobilized in the soil. And that, is, that relates directly to the amount that we uh, see immobilized at harvest. So, uh, and, and it's that that subsequently is prone to leaching because it breaks down in the autumn when the soil starts, uh, warm, uh, it's still warm, but it starts being uh, uh, wetted up and maybe cultivated, then that can uh, it's this that will turn into leachable nitrate. So that's that's my uh, uh, addressing efficiency fertilizers and losses. Um, uh, I think I'm on for question four, and I've got six, so I'll have to move faster. But. Um, how much, do the, the, obviously fertilizer's got a little more expensive, and I just want to run through the evidence for changing the amounts that we apply. So um, this is, again, the, the graph uh, that has lived with me all my career. So grain yield on the left, and uh, apply then along the bottom, and grain protein on the right. So if we look at one typical experiment, Again, we've got fertilizer doubling yield from 5 tons to 10 tons per hectare. Um, generally, what we do is to fit a curve as best we can through that. There's been lots of arguments about what curve you should fit, but we've standardized on one particular shape, uh, which doesn't quite fit this last point in this particular case, but it generally fits in most cases. And then what we do is work out where the optimum is on that, which is the point at which any extra uh, uh, um, nitrogen, a, a kilogram of extra nitrogen applied is not paid for by the extra grain produced, and that is the economic optimum. For most of my career, uh, the ratio between, it, 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 well, the, it has needed three kilograms of grain to pay for a kilogram of nitrogen. Um, since the, the noughties sometime, I can't remember exactly when, it became five to one, and now it's closer to ten to one. And that, this is what happens to the optimum. It decreases by about 20 kilograms or a bit less uh, from 3 to 1 to 5 to 1 and by about 50 kilograms from 5 to 1 to 10 to 1. Um, and uh, the effect on yield is very small. It's uh, between 5 to 1 and 10 to 1. It's 0.3 of a ton per hectare. Uh, so a lot smaller than you could probably notice on the farm. Um, but the effect on protein is quite significant. So uh, the difference between 5 to 1 and 10 to 1 is about one percentage point of protein. Uh, so, uh, and that will be, um, it ought to make more uh, grain available to uh, Diageo and the other distillers, and it should be, um, uh, it should make the uh, yields of, of alcohol more, uh, greater per tonne of grain um, and uh, whether it makes it greater per hectare I'm not sure um, so the, uh, we've looked at the shapes of the curve for all the different crops um, and these are the, uh, the there are cal there's a calculator on the HDB website if you want to do the sums for yourself but these the, the, the break even ratio is along the bottom here going from naught up to 12 it's, uh, this has all been standardized on uh, the current recommendations and showing you the changes from the current recommendations. So the, we've got a 
break even of five to one in the recommendations, and that's uh, showing that oats, the adjustment should be uh, much less than for wheat. Barley, the evidence isn't particularly strong, and talking to Alex Sinclair uh, about the Scottish evidence, we think that barley probably should be sort of halfway between oats and wheat uh, on, on these lines. But oilseed rape uh, has a very flat response curve, which means that the adjustments for price uh, should be a lot bigger. But of course, the, uh, the, um, well, the starting point is two and a half break-even ratio, and uh, the prices uh, have not changed that much uh, in, in because the Aussie rate price has, has remained high more than the cereal price so the adjustments are actually in the end about the same for wheat and for oilseed rate. Um, but it, it, just to clarify the break-even ratio is the fertilizer price divided by the nutrient content and then that divided by the grain value. Um, right. Um, Checking that the, your end use is right. Now for this, I'm going to a series of experiments we did um, about eight years ago, uh, which we called the LEARN project. Um, you can do your own experiments on farm, and we went to 18 farms, um, uh, none of them in Scotland as far as I can remember, um, but 18 farms where we set up experiments like this. So they, they each, they were tramline trials, they each had their standard N rate, which in this example is 220, and so the rest of the field would be 220, but this, these two tramlines, one had 60 kilograms less, and one had 60 kilograms more. So uh, it's, it's a pretty simple, simple design. Uh, the map here shows the yield variation. You can see the yield variation is big. So compared with the sort of response we would expect between, you know, across a range of 120 kilograms per hectare of N, uh, there's a lot of other variation that's a lot bigger. So it's very important to set up these experiments in a fair way. And in this case, it's been done in a reasonably fair way because the high yielding areas are at one end and, and, and go across all the treatments and the lower yielding areas go across all the treatments. Um, but we did, uh, uh, we did this with 18 farms over four years and three fields per farm. So we ended up with a lot of data and we've managed, uh, because we were in a group, we shared this uh, b between all of us. And um, this, is, this is the 150 uh, different experimental results. You can see the, the sort of that the generally the response across 120 kilograms, a big range of 120 kilograms, the response in grain yield was fairly small. I'll look at those uh, in more detail in a minute. But um, the protein levels were much more strongly influenced. You can see that the slopes, particularly down the bottom here, uh, are uh, quite a lot steeper and, and uh, steeper down the bottom than they are at the top. But um, if you don't want to do your own experiments, and you know, the, I, I would be a strong advocate of doing some experiments if you're at all uncertain about what, uh, w whether you're using the right levels. Um, grain protein can be very helpful. So this is the 150 odd experiments showing the range of grain yield response in kilograms per amount of nitrogen applied. And we know from the break-even ratio has recently gone from 5 to 10. So somewhere uh, uh, sort of along here is where the optima were. Um, so generally, the sites that were showing big responses generally had low protein, and the sites that showed um, generally uneconomic responses generally had high protein. So protein is a really helpful um, diagnostic for whether you're getting your nitrogen right. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, it's one of the things that's really 
made me an action research practitioner. Basically, action research is just DIY research, research by the beneficiaries of that research. So um, I am a big advocate of you all taking more... I'm a scientist, so I, I, I love data but, and, and analyzing data, and that's what's been the joy of having the yield, the, the yield enhancement network data to work with. But I, I would, whether you're in the yen or not, I believe you can benefit from uh, taking and recording and I ideally sharing uh, data. And I know that's something that Scottish agronomy do uh, very well. So um, uh, just to summarize, the important checks that you should be making um, relate to the soil nitrogen supply, obviously relate to the yield levels and any lodging that occurs on the farm. But this grain nitrogen or grain protein assessment is an important part of actually working out and um, making sure you're managing your, uh, your main nutrient uh, properly. Um, In-season monitoring, uh, I, I'm less sure about. I, I actually like, I've got one of these in my bag I could show you afterwards, but the, um, this color chart is something that was uh, developed in the Philippines for rice and um, and it's been used widely in the Punjab in India, and I don't really understand why we don't use it. Uh, if it had been properly calibrated, it's a really useful way of, of judging the sort of nitrogen status of a crop without any need for analysis or anything. So um, uh, uh, leaf color charts are uh, 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 a possible way we could improve our nitrogen management. But lastly of all, I would encourage, if you are at all uncertain, uh, to, you to be doing some testing on the farm. Because, as somebody nicely said in the question time, all farms are different. Um, my last question is... And I'm, you're fine. You're fine. Am I all right? Yeah. Um, my last question is about plant breeding, and it's, it's hoping to lead into Phil. Where's Phil gone? Oh, he's over there. Good. So, so you've got plant breeding after, and I just thought I'd throw a spanner or two in Phil's direction. So, so uh, after lunch, we're going to so, and ask the question: Does plant breeding give us? Does it and um, could it give us better and efficiency? And there's there's you know terrible temptation in agronomy to sort of put all the responsibility on making things better on on breeding. Um, and there's been no shortage of work on this, uh, including by me and all my colleagues. Um, we, we published a paper in 2009, that is, which basically showed that uh, the, the, if, if you work out the efficiency in the sort of incomplete way, which is basically the amount of grain produced per amount of nitrogen used, um, ignoring how much protein you're exporting from the farm, but if you do it in that way, then um, breeding of barley, because breeding has selected for low protein, has actually increased yield without increasing uh, nitrogen uh, requirements, and therefore the efficiency of barley has gone up. But the breeding of wheat, because it's emphasized high protein, um, basically the efficiency has stayed the same or even gone down. Um, there is a huge amount of research on the genetic improvement of nitrogen use efficiency, and I, uh, it, uh, we, we've done a lot ourselves, particularly challenging the use of this term, uh, because actually if you think about it, the most nitrogen efficient way of growing a crop is to put no fertilizer on it at all. It's to have virtually no nitrogen, just the nitrogen it can get from the soil. It's bound to be a lot more efficient if you just look at how much grain you get per unit of um, nitrogen used. Um, so we, we um, did a, 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 a project that we called Hilo, and then we've done a project that we've called Sintrin, and I'm just going to quickly summarize what we got out of that. Hopefully, I don't know whether it's going to relate to what Phil says later, but um, lots, of, lots of the research groups do, do their nitrogen, do their um, variety comparisons at two N levels. Two N levels is not enough. Um, 
you need at least four N levels in order to work out what the nitrogen requirement of a variety is, as well as its yield. That made us develop this idea that you could actually ramp the amount of nitrogen you apply on a small plot from one end to the other, and then work out where the optimum was within each plot and compare the varieties in that way. And we played around with this idea at uh, uh, um, this farm in uh, Stetchworth and um, came to the conclusion it, it, it could be used. We had to develop some new statistics in order to let us do it, but um, the plots looked like that, and the conclusions were, um, and this is including the work that we did with, this was a, a collaboration that involved Cambridge University and the NIAB and, um, and collaborators in India. Um, but we, we dubbed what we were looking for a high-low variety, so high yield, low optimum. Um, and uh, trying to emphasize that you know, when you're breeding a crop for uh, yield and disease resistance, you have to measure both. If you're breeding a crop for uh, nitrogen efficiency and, and yield, you need to measure both. So that's what we do with these, with these optiplots. We identified triticales and, um, and some of the Danish material that we got from, uh, um, from across the North Sea um, as having, having this characteristic of high yield, low optimum. And I, I, I remember going to a Yen meeting in, on the Black Isle and saying to them, why don't you get your varieties from Denmark? So I'd be interested to hear whether you do. Um, we were looking for what the sort of general indicative traits were for a nitrogen efficient variety and we ended up with this list here. But I, I must stop. So this is my summary uh, of what we need to change. And the first thing, and it's been the theme through everything I've said, is um, that we need to recognize that our farms are all different, and that means on each farm we need to be taking farm-specific measurements and really understanding how that farm works. Um, I hope I'm not, so that I hope I am um, teaching grandmothers to suck eggs, but um, so uh, monitoring recent performance on the farm, monitoring soils, avoiding deficiencies, um, through the, this, um, you know, brilliant discovery of the yen, really, that you can, you can get a com comprehensive nutritional footprint of a crop just by analyzing its grain. Um, and and uh, consider some on-farm testing. The second thing is, clearly, we need to reduce nitrogen losses from the farm, the ones that, that go off into the waters or into the atmosphere. Um, which means we need to be, uh, you know, top of the list is management of manures, um, but we also need to do all the things that are being talked about um, in relation to uh, regenerative agriculture, but, but I would say keeping productivity up. And um, lastly, but very importantly, we need to recognize the whole farm system that uh, actually what we should be planning to do is to re all that nitrogen we sell or uh, ship off the field, uh, we need to be thinking how we're going to recycle that because that is what ends up being lost to the environment if it's not managed carefully. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. No mean feat to uh, summarise 40 years of work in 40 minutes. So but I'm sure there's quite a lot of questions would anyone like to start off? Um, thanks, Roger. Um, the, have you done any work or looked at foliar applications of urea? There's a lot of chat around about that these days. And have you any opinions one way or another? Uh, uh, so, some, yes. I mean, it started in the 1980s. Um, did everybody hear the question? It was a bit faint. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, foliar urea, um, but presumably in place of spring granular, yeah. 
Um, I mean, clearly it's a challenge. Urea, you know, the maximum solubility is only 20% or 20 kilograms of N per 100 litres. So um, to get the total dose via folia is immediately a challenge. Uh, we've done work, we're looking at folia slurries, um, which actually scorched the leaves. Um, we, uh, I, I mean, my, I have a general, you know, strong advocacy of investment in foliar nutrition because I actually regard the soil as, as a rather difficult thing to manage and it would be so much better if we had the amount of investment that has been put into at chems put into uh, foliar nutrition, I think we'd be a lot further ahead than we are. But um, the news from the initial experiments in the 1980s was that the efficiency was pretty similar to the granular, but it was less reliable. So sometimes better, sometimes a lot worse. So um, generally we couldn't advocate foliar at that stage. Um, we then looked at the losses, had a PhD in the 1990s with Rothamsted and so on. Um, and, you know, th there is a significant ammonia emission. We weren't playing with inhibitors at that stage, um, and possibly we could improve things by using inhibitors. But then we did, when we were doing the work with slurries in the noughties, um, we did look at inhibitors, and, um, well, we had this scorch, and that was a complete... Um, you know, we we only had enough funding to do one experiment, and uh, it was um, disappointing. Alistair, do you want this mic? Uh, on your last slide, there you got a comment about legumes are a double-edged sword. Well, we, well, most of us will grow a type of legume and get a very good yield from it. So why are you saying it's a double-edged sword? I'm assuming it's something to do with protein. Well, it, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm only, I'm not thinking commercially, okay? So, uh, and obviously it's a low input crop, and if you can get a good yield on it, I mean, it's, they generally have a reputation for being less reliable than cereals, but if you can get a good yield in a reliable way, um, yeah, and, and a bean crop will pass nitrogen on to the, but it, it also, where is it going to be eaten? That, that's my that's my sharp bit of the sword, or the you know the the, the bit, bit but that's introducing nitrogen into the environment that isn't necessarily needed. It's free for you, but and then you sell the grain, and that grain goes to feed probably an animal, which will excrete it. So. I, I think that's negative for the environment. It may be good commercially. Okay, there's time for one more question. Uh, Roger will be here at the end of the day for further questions on the panel, but um, we've got time for one more question before we break for ever important lunch. John. Roger, that was fascinating. Um, can we go briefly back to your very first slide? I think you said something very important in that that I'm not entirely sure I took on um, to do with the nitrous oxide emissions when we didn't put on any nitrogen. Could you just explain that? Did I pick that up incorrectly? Are we saying, yes, this graph. So if we don't put on any nitrogen, there's still a big problem. Is that what you were saying? No, I, uh, no. The, the, when we don't put on any nitrogen, the problem is we don't. We only produce four tons per hectare, and and somebody has to produce the missing four. And that if if extra land has to be turned into arable land, then is is this answering your question? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So what, what is the point? No, but the, 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 you know, if you're not applying any fertilizer, nitrogen, there, there actually is a background emission from soil, um, which is interestingly not taken into account in most accounting schemes. But, um, but there's obviously none attributable to the fertilizer. <laughs>